people you need this, right? Mm. Most of the major festivals around the world have what they call a green room, which is where the artists or the writers, whoever it is, hang out. Um, and the space is only for writers and organizers. And the one in Edinburgh is the most awesome because it's it's decked out like a like a really really nice living room with sofas, uh, really nice uh, handcrafted pastries, free flow of wine, champagne, fine Scotch whiskey, free flow. And, you know, and of course everyone gets tanked up before they go on stage, which is why their performances are the best ever. But I told I told Paul from the Singapore Arts Council, National Arts Council, to have a green room for the Singapore Writers Festival, and they did more. Oh, what a so problem. wait, so I made one up. So I brought booze. I've been bringing booze to the last two. I think I was Singapore yeah, Writers yeah. Festival uh, to hand them out, and my unofficial, quite quite illegitimate little booze corner at the back has become quite popular. So every year, people ask me, hey, "Are we doing Writers Bar again?" Uh, so if you if you hang around at the Writers Festival, come look for me, and you get free booze usually at the end of end of the. Okay, cool. So, all right, I'll definitely look for you again. I, I remember that you were giving um. What was it like back then and now? Are you, are you like interrogating me and then the rest of them? Yeah, yeah, one, one by one, one by one. Oh. Yeah, you all wait your turn. I feel like I'm in Heathrow again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not practicing. Wait, wait, I'll have other questions for you. <laughs> yeah, um, poetry well, scene back then. When is then? Borders, I think. I remember seeing a when? picture of okay. you. Okay, well, I, I first started publishing in the mid-1990s, a whole bunch of us did. Uh, yes, that dates me. Um, and back in 1995, there was this, this thing called the Singapore Literature Prize and the National Book Award. There is still a Singapore Literature Prize now, but it is a shadow and a fraction of what it used to be. Back then, it was for unpublished writers and unpublished manuscripts. So, in other words, it was a spur for people to write stuff. Nowadays, it's given out to books that are already published, right? Back then, it was for books that were not published, they were for manuscripts. So it made a whole bunch of new talent come out and write. And we got our manuscript sort of assessed. To be shortlisted was already a very big thing. Very often, you would get picked up for publishing just, just to be shortlisted. And that's how we all found each other as new writers. You're talking about the, the Yong Shu Holmes and the Darren Charles and the Boy Kim Chain. And later on, the Alpians and the Cyrils, we all sort of <laughs> found each other that way, right? <laughs> Do you think something like that should happen again? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Is there anyone proposing to bring up you know, these unpublished writers? Well, things are kind of different now. And if you, if you want to look at the past 10, 20 years of literary history, there's a lot of, there's a lot of story to tell. And I'm very long-winded, so I better not go there. Um, but to put it, to, to, to sort of cut a long story short, there was nothing resembling the sort of lively uh, poetry scene we have here today. Most of the activity was in the universities with people like Edwin Thumbo and Mr. Ping and so on. You kind of had to have Edwin Thumbo write a, a forward before they will think about publishing you. And there were only two people in, two publishers in the whole of Singapore that would even publish uh, poetry if they will answer your phone calls. One was Na uh, National University Press, and one was Times Publishing, Yikes. right? And uh, if you ask Lisa Page, she'll tell you that to even be published by Times, you have to sign your life away. Basically, all, not just her firstborn child, but all subsequent children, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, Times had first right of refusal. In other words, they have to turn you down before you can bring your book to anyone else. They don't even have to say no. They can just sit on your book and you will never publish again, which is what happened to her, you know? Um, our reaction to that as young people was to say, screw that, we don't owe you anything. Uh, we were not taught by you, we did not come under the, many of us did not come through the NUS system, although some did. And so we decided to bring back a lot of what we learned from studying overseas or seeing what had happened elsewhere. And we started readings, we started uh, small presses, and that's why today you have your ethos books and later on your first fruits. Uh, 
so on and so forth. We have so many now. So that, that was like, kind of like the, the pioneering batch that started this uh, independent Kind of, la, kind of. And then there was 20 years of activity and now you have the diversity you have, you have today. It also helped that this was the same time that the internet started coming on. So it became easy to sort of sidestep the big boys. I think that's, that's very important. It wasn't just that we were very garang and went and did things. We also had the tools, which now we take for granted. Back then it was new. The idea that you could, you could sort of collaborate with people online without ever meeting them and put the book together in six months that would have usually taken five years, that was new then. Now six months is like slow. So it's a lot easier right now, right? Okay. Is there, do you think there's a difference between the, the page poetry scene and the spoken word scene? Yeah. What kind of yes and no? Back then we didn't make a distinction. Oh. We was kind of still too young and too small. There used to be, I don't know if, if I was telling them the story earlier, there used to be this monthly reading series at Boat Key that later on moved to uh, Chimes. And uh, it was started by this Nigerian, not con artist, by a Nigerian <laughs> academic who was also a poet. His name was Sky. Uh, his nickname was Sky. And, you know, from his tradition is very much performance, writing, reading, the whole African tradition where there is no distinction between page and stage. It's, it's all, it all comes, at least, from the oral tradition, right? So he started a poetry reading series at Boat Key uh, for his colleagues and students, started roping many of us in. And that was going on for years and years and years when he had to retire and leave the country. Uh, Paul Tan took over, Yong Shu Hong took over, and it, it sort of spawned a whole range of uh, child readings. There was one at MPH, there was one at the book, club, I started one at Borders, back when Borders uh, was still around, and it was so popular that Borders kicked us out. Uh -huh. Why? <laughs> Why? Because there were so many people coming for our readings, I'm talking about like two to three times this number, right, inside Borders, and they were upset because we were clogging up the aisles. <laughs> Although most of the people who came actually Poetry bought cholesterol. books. Uh, so they eventually sort of kicked us out, and of course, as you know, Borders stopped being managed by Singaporeans after a while. That's where we were kicked out from. Okay, and and right now the spoken word scene. I'm sure maybe you you've been to to a number. What, what, yeah, what so, do you feel about so, it? Right. So everyone's like a lot more specialized now. Back then, there there wasn't this distinction. And in a sense, we are still fortunate in that people cross the boundaries. You know, you have people like Yisha, and Yisha who hangs out with the spoken word community and their news, but also of course is a published writer and so on and so forth. Um, you have people like Puja Nancy, Mark, of course. So in a sense, we're, we're still not as segregated. You know, we, we don't really have literary apartheid the way some other communities do. Um, when, I was, when I was in Poetry Parnassus, this was in 2012, there was this festival where they part of the London Olympics, they invited one poet from every country in the world. Um, this is one of my highlights, now, because Mr. Ireland was Seamus Heaney, one of my heroes, oh, okay, wow. and I was Mr. Singapore, so I got to hang out with him. Um, but what was striking was they had readings for everyone, and they, they put all the readings in parallel. So the spoken word was at the same time as the main stage poets, at the same time as what they call the avant-garde poets. Because in London, from what I hear, nobody who goes to one of these would be interested in the other. But most of the international poets who did not have these distinctions in their heads just wanted to attend and hear good poets uh, regardless of the sort of style. But it, it was so rigid that they programmed it in such a way that you kind of had to choose. And I just realized we are fortunate we don't have to choose. Yeah, we are each other's we're people. lucky in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Nabila performed in, in, in London. I started doing yeah. performances there. I did an open mic in London. Okay. And with I, like I'm a huge, uh, I have a huge fear of public speaking, uh, and this in itself is absolutely nerve-wracking to me. Even though I know it's mental masturbation because I know all of you, <laughs> so <laughs> technically I'm not supposed to feel that way. Uh, but like the first time I, I did an open mic, it was at this small venue. Um, well, it wasn't small. It was one of the uh, basement venues in London called Poetry and Club, and I. Uh, it took me like I think three months to get my guts together and sort of go up there and threaten the people that I was gonna vomit in 
in their face, projectile vomit, and um, but it went okay. There's still a video up on it though. Please don't look. I'm just telling you that there's a video. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's how it started, and then I, it was like a lot of sitting down and watching other people do it, and and then reading. And I'd been writing for a long time, so I never realized that there was this. Thing called spoken word and I never knew until someone linked me up to a Sarah K poem or something, I think it was Charlene, um, who did that and she, that sort of like introduced me to, to this niche of, of spoken word, um, this form of poetry, which I never knew about and um, it was cool, so, I so liked it. Cool, so, so now, <laughs> now you're back here and you're very involved in the spoken word scene. Right? Yeah, basically I went back and I was like, because uh, I worked with Vanessa and Charlene before for an art gallery, and then basically I went back and was like, oh my god, we have to do something. There was this new thing called poetry, have you heard about it? And then, <laughs> um, uh, and then we started Destination Inc. Um, that night, uh, when when was later. this? When was it? One, two years ago? Two, two years, two and a half years ago. Right. Yeah. So, it, yeah, like me, April, uh, June 2012. Are, are you happy with where everything is going as, yeah. as a scene on the whole? Oh, it's, well, I feel like I'm feel? still new to the scene to to have um, that much say over like how happy I am with how everything else is going. But I'm happy with how the open mic um, initiatives are going and I'm happy with that people are starting their own little groups. And Well, yeah, I think it, that more could be done. Like, I think that's what people should start with, like, work with people that they like and know and um, start collectives and collaborate more um, in their own accord. Because a lot of people say, oh, I don't have time to do that, but none of us have time and we somehow manage. If you really like it and you find people you can work with. So, so, you, so you do see more people getting together and uh, yeah, I doing hope, this? Yeah, I hope that. Okay, how, how about for yourself, I mean, as your own growth, as uh, your unspoken word artist and your, your future projects, what you're thinking about, you know, um, what's happening there? Well, okay, so seeing how I just discovered spoken word literally two and a half, three years ago, um, I, I have always planned to publish and I wanted to publish a... a and it started out like big, right? I want to publish a novel, I want to publish several novels, I want to do a series, I want to do like Harry Potter, number two. But then that turned out to be a, a flash fiction collection, which I want to do right now. So that's my um, immediate plan, I want to write a flash fiction collection. Um, sorry, what was your question? <laughs> um, it's like, um, do you have any other spoken word um, projects you right. feel yes. about now? So, in terms of spoken word, I... I, I found out that the thing I love the most and uh, while I love reading and performing and stuff I like reading and performing with other people so um, I started uh, we started Scallywax last year when Mark invited us to do Lit Up um, as uh, like four of us so it was Victoria, me, Raksha and Jennifer and three other um, Malaysian poets uh, and we did a show and that was like I think my first no, it was my second. I did party action people before that. Uh, but it was one of the major um, highlights of, of what I did in Spoken Word because it was the one time that I felt like I could write whatever I want and it would still be part of, of the team or the group. Um, so I want to do more of that. I want to collaborate with the girls. I want to uh, do more performance, theater style, poetry. Um, I want to watch more of that stuff in Singapore and I feel like that can be fleshed out a lot more and, here. Okay, and I also believe that you feel that like, spoken word can and should be used for highlighting social justice issues. And social justice. Yeah, social justice. <laughs> Makes me sound like a superhero. Um, social justice. Social change. Yeah, okay. social change. Although change can be bad also, right? change, degradation of the environment. Um, no, um, yeah, I do think that it has that potential and I think it goes hand in hand um, together. Uh, and it comes sort of naturally with spoken word, I feel, more than anything. How about the audience? I mean, 
audience response to your work, to the work that you've done, what, what do you feel mm. can improve? Or? It has been good. Um, audience reaction. Okay, so I'm just saying from and like in terms of what we we've done as a group um, for Scallywags, for example. I do enjoy that there are a lot of people who are like-minded who come to our shows and then they react like positively because they, they feel like, oh, that resonated. Uh, uh, it's great that you guys are doing this because I don't see any other groups doing that as well. But I would like to expand that particular... Um, I, want, I want more audiences from like different groups, basically. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll definitely be talking about that. Um, we're gonna move on to Mark uh, in relation to audience responses as well. Uh, you you organize a number of, uh, of festivals, lit up, and uh, music cities coming up, and, and you've done the, a number of shows as well. Uh, what's your personal view about our audience and how they are responding? Well, I think. Uh, the audience needs to grow. We need a more varied, diverse audience. Sometimes we have the same people coming for the shows, which is good because you have an audience base, but it's a small audience base. And we may be a small country, but there are a lot of people in the country. And it's, uh, it's growing, you know? So, um, but what I feel perhaps is uh, maybe there aren't enough people who ascribe value to words, whether it's page poetry or spoken word, and maybe they just don't, they just aren't interested, you know? And, and so that's a bit of a struggle, but, you know, as artists, you just keep going. You keep you keep creating and plugging stuff, you know, and and, and hopefully that, that will work, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, just, just to add to what Mark is saying, I think there is an audience in Singapore and certainly in the region. Um, one of the problems I, I realized, I noticed um, by, both by working in Singapore and in traveling, is that Singapore is not recognized as a site of cultural production. In other words, people who read books don't think... There are people who read books and there are people who buy books and there are many of them in Singapore. They just don't think Singapore is a place that comes up with stuff worth reading or listening to. Um, and every time I come across people who, read, who sort of go, I never knew that Singapore had things like that. I've been working here for 10 years and I didn't know you do poetry readings. Until, you know, some chance occasion, whether it's your event or my event or whatever. And then they realize that there's this whole parallel universe under their feet. Do you know the number of Burmese people in Singapore, give you a classic example, 300,000. Do you know that some of the most well-known contemporary Burmese poets, like in the, they, they tour New York, they tour UK, are Singaporean PRs and we don't know who they are. And they've been living here and working, some of them working as civil servants, and we don't know who they are. And they don't know who we are. There are so many of these stories. I keep running into like, uh, French bankers and Swedish watchmakers and you know people who just show up one day and, and, and they thank me not necessarily for my work but for opening their eyes to the possibilities of what happens here. So collectively I think we need to put the word out more that there is stuff going on and there is hopefully I would like to think good stuff going on that's worth checking out because I think there is a market we're not reaching it because we've all been brought up to think we are not good at this. The other day I had a, I had a panel at the National Library and asked them, they came for the panel to be fair, I asked them, any of you read a Singaporean writer or listened to a Singaporean poet ever? At first I said past year and then no hands, and past two years and then no hands, and then ever in your life and then maybe two hands came up. Um, and then they said, one, I asked them, I turned, I turned the question on the panel, I go, why not? What is it, you know? You're here, you've heard us do our thing, you know, what is it? Why do you think you've not uh, consumed or experienced Singaporean writing or poetry, whatever you call it, Singaporean art? And, it's, and one of these very nice ladies, very nice, and they said, well, all our lives we've been brought up to think, you know, only Shakespeare's worth reading. No. And, 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 you know, I think where that, that come from? Where does that come from? Yeah. And I think, oh, I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I personally feel that I think Mark is trying to change that by bringing poetry to the people, to the heartlands with music city. Right? <laughs> you want to tell us more about that? Well, I think uh, it's it's a bit of a different thing because most of the art events are all 
uh, concentrated in the city center. So um, this is a good example. You know, and Slam is at a tab at Orchard, and then you have Artistry and you know Kampung Glam and all these places. But a uh, musicity, um, which is uh, a festival that celebrates music and spoken word, and we have commissioned bands and spoken word poets to create original tracks. So the bands and the poets actually walked the streets of Tiong Bahru, that's where it's at this year. Street and created tracks based on specific locations that we assigned to them. So for example, it's a band called Monster Cat and I gave them the Monkey God Temple. And they came up with an amazing track that actually layers in loops of the, of the temple and, 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 and the chants. So they were working with the space, you know, and that's, that's I mean, that's the, the, the production side of it. But the other thing that we really wanted to do with Music City was to move away from the city centre, move to a housing estate. Tiong Bahru, well, some might say, oh, it's a hipster area, all that, but don't discount the fact that there's so much history, there's so much culture, there's so much depth to the area. Every street literally has a story, and that's the kind of thing that we try and do in Music City. Let I me mean, create more. Literally, we are creating local literature you know, with Music City, you know, and I think that's a very important thing to do. Yeah. And do you think there's a compelling mix, the use of music and spoken word? And do, do you think that will reach out to a whole new range of audiences? Of course. Is that your hope? We, we oh. hope that with the bands, and I mean, we're getting bands like Sam Willows and Monster Cat and Sierra, and, and these are bands that uh, some are indie, some are already well known, some are breaking through. And, and perhaps if people not really, don't really know spoken word and they want to get to know a bit more, they are familiar with the bands, and so it's. Uh, you get a band and you get a spoken word. Or you know the spoken word, then you come with spoken word, oh, and you get a band, you know? So we're trying to reach out to uh, different demographics. And, and a lot of my work is multidisciplinary, and I believe in that. So, you know, trying to reach new demographics through various genres of art. Do, do, do you think the, the mainstream media is supportive in helping put the word out that it's not something? Yeah, I wonder ask about your challenges and all that. So oh, what about the media Mainstream support? media so far, we've had an interview in, in BT times and uh, we've got Juice on as a, as a magazine and uh, we've had shout out uh, quite a lot of it online. Um, so far, no, nothing from Street Times, we're hoping they'll do a feature and nothing from today. But I'm also, yeah, I'm wondering how, you know, how many people read Street Times? <laughs> <laughs> um, but certainly, um, we've been pushing it online, you know, Facebook and, and various other platforms. Instagram, Twitter, so so you have to go where the people are, you know, I think, yeah. Alright, um, we, we're going to just move quickly to the floor and uh, I'm going to ask if there's anyone here that needs to ask any, uh, they would like to ask any specific question to any of the specific poets, like maybe we can uh, start with, uh, with Mark first, whether there's uh, anyone, anyone wants to ask him any questions? Just, um, just open the floor, whoever wants to ask yeah. whatever. Steph? Okay, uh, I guess you've been involved in spoken word, um, like particularly spoken word poetry, longer than other people. Um, I guess how do you think, as, <laughs> longer than most of us here, I feel, uh, as someone who does has been doing spoken word as well for the past few years, um, I guess I'm interested to know how you think it's changed in, uh, in Singapore, how you think it's grown and where you think it's going, and uh, what can we, what do you hope for, what are your dreams for like this scene of like spoken word and poetry in Singapore? Next, in your lifetime, maybe. Uh, nobody's asking what are my dreams. Aww. <laughs> my very first slam was the very first movie <laughs> slam in Singapore in 2003 uh, in Velvet Underground. And slam was in Velvet Underground for like five or six years, and, and then they moved to Blue Jazz. And I mean, I've been in the slam scene for yeah over 10 years now. And back then, there was no such thing really as spoken word. There wasn't, you know, spoken word really became uh, more of a genre in the last maybe three years or four years. I mean, in part due to to um, YouTube influence and things like that, and then people get more awareness of things. But for a long time, there was there were readings, poetry readings, and then there was slam, and then slam was this this offshoot that was quite small. We, some some months at slam, we had more slammers than audience members. So it was just everybody just performing to each other. And Slam was uh, not not seen as spoken word, seen as a more performative kind of poetry, seen as a competitive form of poetry because of the, of the judges and all that. So really spoken word didn't really exist until maybe 
2009, 2010, maybe even 11, and, and then it started growing. Um, and then we had all the open mics and all that. One thing that I really appreciate though about about uh, our scene is that is is that you see the individual come through. Everybody is their own voice, and you see that voice come through. We are not really subscribing to a particular model or style or narrative art of, of spoken word that you see some the UK or US scene. But it's not wrong, but but over here we we kind of like oh let's just do our own thing, and everybody does their own thing, and that's really good. And what so far, you know, it's been individuals that have come up. You haven't really got a clump of people that have come up or say this is a class of 2012 and like 12 forwards are rising, you know, magically like mushrooms are very It doesn't happen that way. You get individuals. And what I would love to see are more individuals who are serious, dedicated, talented, who, who are passionate about their craft, who, who keep on writing despite the fact that they go to army or they get jobs or they get whatever, you know, that people will keep on going through all these things and, and that's what will that's what will make the bedrock of the scene will keep it going. Otherwise because over the years I've seen like the original slam scene has changed so much. Everybody from there is not is not there anymore, you know? Yeah. So Oh and the other big thing is that we started off with a lot of expats and now it's a lot of locals. So that's good because you know you're learning to own the scene and grow it. Yeah. No below you got anything to add on to that? I have a question like trigger point or a turning point that made the slam scene change that dramatically like from experts to locals or from just a slam to slightly more open than the world before. Is it any part of the pop culture? It helped when we moved to Blue Jazz. But it, we only started growing in 2010, 11. Somehow there was a bit of a shift, and maybe this was, uh, I would say in the last five years, Singapore's art scene has opened up a lot more as well. You know, Alvin, you, you, you might want to jump in on this. Um, it, it seems that, at least in Singapore, one of the one of the ways that, one of the things that distinguishes spoken word from other genre, if you can even make that divide, because the lines blur anyway. <laughs> and even back in the 90s, we had people who were doing what would today be considered spoken word. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the spaces that people occupy and you know it's it's almost venue driven the kind of work the kind of people that come to a place like this versus a bookshop versus a more quiet place and so on and so forth I was just thinking today what am I going to say uh, bloody hell I don't think about these things every day um, would be you know if if what is your scene right not that no, it's not about better or worse it's all about your particular form of music, is it more suitable for the living room or the party dance floor or the bedroom or the kitchen or whatever? You know, I would say that I tend towards the bedroom and the, and the sort of the quiet study because I'm actually pretty much an introvert and really shy. Um, and if I don't have to, if I don't have to put myself out there, I'd rather not. Although I've learned to do it like, you know, just over the years. Um, and it's not about right or wrong, it's like different types of music, right? Jazz versus Chopin. It's just, it's just kind of different. But I thought it's quite interesting that the scene seems to have been, sort of, seems to have gravitated to certain hot spots and spaces, like blue jazz, uh, like, and before that, Velvet Underground, and now, and now in the sense of Bloom Club. Uh, and, and I'm not familiar enough with the, with the extent to which different people actually try and move out of their literally comfort zone. Um, I know you're trying some stuff. I thought that's something quite interesting uh, that would be good to see more of. I'm, I'm sort of trying to see if we can get funding to do literally work in the HDB heartland. Both stuff up on the walls the way I did the MRTs. Uh, I, had, I had some, I had a campaign to put like public poems on the MRTs and I'm thinking can we have them on the walls in the void decks because if not, if the only things you have there are like warning letters and RC committee meetings. <laughs> Why not put some poems there that have plenty of wall space? I'm thinking it doesn't just have to be printed stuff, it can be performances, it can be spoken word, it can be music. Is there space for this sort of thing? Is anyone doing it? I don't know. You know, I've, I've, always, I've always been saying that, that we need to go into the heartlands. I mean, Musicity is an example of that, but then you have so many other satellite towns that you, are... Yeah. It's just yeah. literally the void that, you know, it's, it's a void. And, and the potential is there, the space is there. You remember the old Dickie Barats and, and you yeah. know how the Malay boys would hang out in the void decks and just jam? Totally. It's completely awesome. That's gone. Yes, it's, it's, 
You know, in, in a sense, we are we're not even inventing something new. We're going back to we're going back to something that we grew up with that seems like that. It's a bit of you know, reclaiming the space. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I think what you you guys are talking about is is, is very relevant and, and very timely because uh, what I was actually going to go into next is is to actually uh, question this whole thing. This is like like Mark Mark said now, uh, or you said that this uh, oh, this, this spoken word scene is like around only a few hot spots, and we're trying to move out beyond that, right? So the thing of uh, what I wanted to talk about was that there were a few organizers that technically do not belong to the scene that actually did events that move beyond our scene and outside the usual hotspots. So I'm just going to briefly run through three of these um, um, events that happened. One happened online, YouTube. Uh, you mentioned YouTube just now, right? We're getting more people um, online. Uh, how, how many of you know of a local spoken word YouTube video that had 25,000 hits? You want to know which one? Which one? There's only one man, 25,000 hits. Benjamin King, right? Yeah. So, so the title is Rich Spoken Word Benjamin King from the Sam Willows, right? Uh, produced and directed by Josiah. 841 likes, okay? And it was done music video style. Um, there was like a, a backing track, down tempo, royalty free music. Uh, the the po poem was, was basically about richness. Uh, it's about uh, it's, it's about not being just uh, materially rich, but also rich as a human being. And um, there was close <laughs> captions of the full poem, and the response was very interesting. Uh, there's hundred comments, global response, okay? not just local response. And the, the response ranged from this made me cry to someone proposed to him. Oh no! Uh, a response to oh, uh, inspiring poetry and God is gorgeous. And someone even wanted to use his poem in a class, okay, in a poetry teaching class. It was not a local teacher asking, it was like probably from UK or Australia. So there was a... Why even? Sorry? Why even? I, I, I'm not, not too sure. But... YouTube, YouTube. 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 Yeah, it, it happened. Someone even wanted to use it. Why even? Yeah, it's like, I, I guess this person found that this poem was something that... Yeah. I thought you meant like why even like the internet yeah. theme. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. So 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 anyway, global recognition, right? Uh, for for this YouTube video, uh, the second example is uh, Mass Hysteria uh, at uh, Substation, and uh, it was uh, of course it's an offshoot of the Punk Binale based on the last Singapore Binale, but it was interesting because it was outside the normal spots, outside our community, even though it was organized and pushed forward by someone in our community itself, which is uh, uh, NASA. So uh, maybe you just want to tell us quickly on, on how the response was? <laughs> Jesus, guys, I know. 100 lesbians! <laughs> yeah, like a thousand lesbians turned up. <laughs> okay, um, well, sorry, what was it? How what was the response? the response? Well, um, the response was actually really, really, really heartening. We were very surprised at how many people turned up. We ended up starting the show a half an hour late.